The Definitive Guide to Australian Property Law by Michael Quinn About the author With over 30 years' experience as a chartered accountant and over 25 years as a practising lawyer, Michael Quinn is the director and co-founder of The Quinn Group. His clients are predominantly private businesses, both Australian and foreign-owned, as well as high-wealth individuals and their families. Michael advises domestic and foreign clients on federal, international and state tax matters and has a special interest in property, taxation, trusts and estate and succession planning. He accepts referrals from other accountants, lawyers, financial planners and finance brokers. The Quinn Group is a firm of accountants, lawyers, financial planners and mergers and acquisitions specialists with four locations throughout Sydney. They have clients throughout Australia and overseas specialising in assisting clients with their tax, accounting and legal needs. Introduction Property refers to anything that has value and is capable of being owned. It refers to people's rights concerning physical and non-physical things. There are two main types of property, personal property and real property. This book will discuss the physical things, land and its attachments, otherwise known as real property. In this easy to understand overview, we will dissect the law surrounding real property, answering your common questions. Please note that the information contained within this audiobook is as current and up-to-date as of its date of publication. Should you have any questions or queries in relation to this audiobook or its content, please feel free to contact the Quinn Group via our website www.quins.com.au or at info at quins.com.au. We have also included a glossary of terms in our physical version of this book in order to help you understand terms. Should you like a physical copy of this book, please contact us. Chapter 1. The Types of Title and the Types of Housing In understanding real property law, we must first understand the types of title. A title is essentially a way of registering the ownership of property. Torrens Title The Torrens system of title is now the most widespread title in Australia that revolutionised property registration. It was first introduced in 1858 in South Australia. It has since been adopted by many nations and jurisdictions across the planet. In Australia, it is the primary register for land and is governed by the Real Property Act 1900. Torrens Title was introduced and created by Robert Richard Torrens for the South Australian Land Title Registry when he was appointed as a registrar. Torrens based his system on the methods used to ensure shipping, using a single register for each land holding and updating it with each new transaction. This is opposed to the other old system title method that involved a sea of paperwork recording each and every transaction on that property. The conclusivity of the Torrens title system enables something known as title by registration. Once registered on the Torrens title register, you become the owner of the property to the exclusion of all others, making registration vital. A certificate of title or title deed, is something vital to the Torrens title system. It is a copy of the related folio of the Torrens title register. It lists the owners of the property and any registered interests such as mortgages, covenants and easements. There are many advantages of the Torrens title system, which include no long series of deeds and documents, just a certificate of title, Title by registration system enables all land to be registered. The Torrens Title Registry is open to the public and is searchable. You are the sole owner of your property under Torrens Title. You are free to make changes to your property with local council approval if required. 
There are no restrictions on pets, barbecues and parkings as in a strata title property. No additional levies as in a strata or community title property. The Torrens title system creates clarity in who owns the property, indefeasibility of title. There is no communal or shared property or bylaws. You have a separate water meter on your property. Leasehold title. A leasehold title is a form of registering land or property wherein land is leased to a party or entity by the state. All mineral rights of the property are reserved to the state. In New South Wales, leasehold title land is typically leased for a period of 99 years, after which the government asks for the property back. The government can decide to change the way in which land is used, and under the leasehold system, when the term has expired, they can take the land. In residential areas, especially, it is more likely, however, to see the New South Wales government extend or renew leasehold terms. Strata title. A type of Torrens title, strata title refers to ownership of property that is both individual and common. Globally, it was first introduced in 1961 in New South Wales to better manage the legal ownership of apartment blocks. Previously, company title was the only adequate method of registering strata units. Notably, and as mentioned, strata title schemes are composed of individual lots and common property. Lots include apartments and garages as shown on the title as being owned by a lot owner. Common property is defined as everything else on the parcel of land that is not comprised in a lot, such as roofs and gardens. Strata management, or body corporate management, is a way of managing the day-to-day -day operation of a strata block of units. Strata managers take on the general tasks of general accounting, budgeting, organising meetings, invoicing levies and contract management, among other key roles. Old system title. Prior to the aforementioned Torrens title system, which was implemented in 1863, there was the old system's title. This system required the creation of a new document or deed every time ownership of the land changed, or an alteration to the title was required, leading to substantial amounts of documents in relation to one singular piece of land. This outdated system was amended due to the high probability of documents and deeds being lost, damaged or destroyed. The old system's title was introduced in 1802 to generate confidence during transactions of land when establishing the lawful owner of a property. Unlike the Torrens system, which has the state guaranteeing ownership, the old system title establishes ownership through the strength of the title. If the quality of a title triumphs another, therefore its strength showcases one's right to the land. This quality and strength is signified through a chain of evidence which solely relies on the seller's ability to gather and examine all the deed and titles relating to the land. However, since a separated deed is created when the land is either sold, leased, subdivided or mortgaged, collecting each deed was an improbable task. Community title. Properties with at least two lots that share a common area are regulated under community title. In New South Wales, this title is governed by the Community Land Management Regulation and New South Wales Department of Fair Trading, pursuant to the Community Title Act 2001 and Community Land Development Act 1989. Simply put, a developer purchases a vast piece of land and subdivides the land for property with residents sharing various common infrastructure and facilities such as roads, basketball courts, parks and parking spaces. Those under a community scheme can be categorised under three types of community title. Community plan, precinct plan and neighbourhood plan. These types of plans have their respective associations who act as an executive board for decision-making and management purposes. Associations have an important role to amend bylaws to better reflect the democratic opinion of the community, while continuing to account for any compliance requirements set by the legislation. To prevent any bias within decisions, 
An association generally consists of those for commercial, retail and residential lots as conflicting interests are a commonality from these sectors. However, for day-to-day -day issues, a community committee or general meetings by all residents and owners are potential solutions. For a community to be legally bound by a community title, a community management statement must be lodged to the land registry services regardless of the type of community title. A community management system sets out certain bylaws residents within the community scheme must abide by. There are no archetypes of bylaws that a community management statement must contain, allowing for flexibility and discretion in determining the regulations for that community. However, the most common bylaws set by the executive board include animals and pets, noise restrictions, company title. Instead of holding a certificate of title to a property as highlighted from the other types of title, a share certificate is held and entitles the purchaser to occupy an area owned by a company. Share certificates can only be issued from a propriety limited company and in New South Wales generally involves home unit companies. Listed under the Corporations Act 2001 as a special purpose company, workers who own or reside in a block of flats together are holding a share certificate. These certificates entitle exclusive rights to owners normally outlined in a company's constitution. Apart from the laws outlined within the constitutions, there are house rules which operate on a day-to-day -day basis. These are more commonly known as bylaws and regulations and can be amended by an executive board or through a democratic vote by the shareholders. House rules have a less binding effect than the constitution's rules but still must be obeyed. House rules usually include administrative matters, how flats are being maintained and used, how common areas are being maintained and used, the ability of owners to let and sublet the flat, safety concerns. Advantages include that company titles are not as expensive as strata titles, more streamlined system when problems occur as dealing with management of a company over a strata title manager. The disadvantages of company titles include value of unit through the share does not increase as significantly as those under strata title. Obtaining loans from the bank may be more difficult as opposed to a strata title. In addition to types of title, there are also types of housing on land. These include terrace houses, standalone, semi-detached, duplex, townhouse and unit or apartment. Each have their own respective advantages and disadvantages, with standalone houses costing more typically than units or apartments. Now that we have looked into the types of title and briefly at the types of housing on land, we will explore the types of property ownership. Chapter 2 the types of property ownership. In addition to types of title, there are also various types of property ownership or ways of holding title. Most typically, these include joint tenancy and tenancy in common, but can also encompass something known as sole proprietorship. In this chapter, we will examine these types of property ownership. Sole proprietorship. Sole proprietorship is a type of ownership operative when one sole person owns 100% of a property and is listed on the title. As most real property in Australia is under the Torrens title system, sole proprietorship means having your name listed on the Torrens title for your property. Joint tenancy. Joint tenancy is where the owners of a property, typically two persons but it can be more, have equal ownership and interest in the property, and a right of survivorship exists. The right of survivorship states that if one of the joint tenants die, the property will automatically pass on to the surviving joint tenant or tenants. Tenants in common. As tenants in common, people can hold an interest in a property in either equal or unequal shares. The right of survivorship does not exist and so if a tenant in common passes away, the other tenants are not automatically given that tenant's share of the property. Trusts 
A trust is a financial structure where a person or company owns assets on behalf of one person or a group of people. It essentially means one person or company will look after an asset, like money or property, and distribute the wealth from this asset to the other people in the trust. Trusts tend to sound more complicated than they are in practice because of high voltage jargon people use when talking about them, such as the titles given to the people involved. The settler is the person or company who set up the trust and names the trustee and beneficiaries. They are not permitted to be a beneficiary and are usually a lawyer or accountant who has no ties to the trust upon finishing its creation. The trustee is the person or company who owns and controls the asset in the trust. There can be more than one trustee in a trust and they are charged with always acting in the best interests of the beneficiaries. Any and all transactions are in the trustee's name. The beneficiary or beneficiaries are the people or companies for whom the trust is set up for. Assets are owned for them and they receive the income from them provided there is some. When a trust is started, the settler will create the trust deed, which sets out how the trustee is to run the trust. Why buy a property through a trust? There are a number of potential advantages that can come when buying property through a trust. Tax benefits. A trust should have its own tax file number and is required to lodge a tax return. However, if the trustee distributes all the income made from an investment property in the financial year to the beneficiaries of the trust, it is considered part of the beneficiary's income and hence part of their income tax return to lodge. Given that some beneficiaries will be in a lower tax bracket than others, this distribution of wealth can provide a considerable tax break and save the members a huge amount compared to if they had just bought an investment property themselves. Asset Protection in a trust, the trustee is the owner of all the assets. So, if you're a beneficiary receiving income from an investment property and you happen to go broke or face legal action, that investment property may be more protected from creditors or the law. This is one of the biggest advantages of owning property through a trust. Profit Distribution Trusts can make it incredibly easy to distribute the wealth from investment properties as the trustee is legally obliged to act in the beneficiary's best interests. This is particularly true in the case of unit trusts as there is an entitled amount for each beneficiary based on the number of units they own. This can prevent someone in a joint venture hoarding income and not distributing it correctly. Estate Planning Trusts make it simple to transfer the ownership of property when someone is sick, has a disability or has died. The trust deed outlines how the trustee should proceed in such circumstances, preventing legal drama which can often occur, especially within families. In some cases the transfer of property in a trust when someone has died is exempt from some taxes and government expenses. Companies Buying investment properties within companies has become less common over the years because companies are not eligible for the 50% capital gains tax discount that individuals receive if they hold a property for more than 12 months. That said, there are some benefits to owning properties within a company structure, including increased asset protection. In some states, a company is eligible for its own land tax threshold, but watch out for grouping provisions. Also, if the company is positively geared, the income tax payable within the company is capped at 30%, which is much lower than the effective 49% individual top marginal rate. We have glimpsed the types of property ownership. Next, we will investigate the different types of property zoning. Chapter 3. The Types of Property Zoning The next aspect of real property you should understand is zoning. Zoning in relation to property refers to the nature of a property and its intended use. There are six main zones in Australia. Residential, commercial, industrial, mixed use, agricultural and public use. For each state, there are more specific zoning codes varying in popularity. We have delved into these in the physical copy of this book. Chapter 4. Property Purchasing Before You Buy Buying by Private Treaty 
Generally, the most common way to buy a house or apartment in Australia is by private treaty. This is where a seller advertises the amount they would like to achieve for their property and then negotiates with prospective buyers. The contract for sale becomes activated once you exchange contracts with the seller, otherwise termed the vendor. At this time, you will also have to pay the full deposit on your place, usually 10% minus any holding deposit you have paid. However, this does not usually mean you are locked in. The standard contract for sale includes a cooling off period during which you can change your mind. However, we at the Quinn Group can have this waived by signing a certificate and explaining the contract to you. Buying at auction. Auctions can sometimes seem daunting, not least because there is no cooling off period. If the gavel comes down and you are the highest bidder, you are usually bound to go through with the purchase, no matter how unfair the contract might be. So as long as you have your solicitor look over the contract for sale before you bid, there is no reason an auction needs to be any riskier than buying at private treaty. Before the auction, we can identify any terms that might not be in your favour and negotiate with the vendor or solicitor to change them. They will also make sure you are buying exactly what you intended to and that it is in the condition you expect. That way, if your bid is the winning one, you can be sure the contract you sign will be in your best interests. When buying at auction, you should also consider arranging pre-purchase inspections to avoid unforeseen costs and repairs down the track. Buying off the plan. Builders often raise capital for their development by selling units or townhouses before they are built. This can be a great way for buyers to get a reduced price and even make a capital gain before settlement. However, it is not risk-free. After all, the property market can move down as well as up, so you could end up losing money. There is also a chance you may not end up with what you intended. For instance, recently a Sydney investor bought an apartment off the plan after the agent promised 180 degree water views. When the complex was finished, the buyer found a wall obstructed his view altogether. He argued the contract for sale was void and asked for his deposit back. The builders refused. So the builder took his case all the way to the New South Wales Court of Appeal, which ruled in his favour. It found that he had relied on the agent's misrepresentation when deciding to buy, so the contract was void. It ordered the builders to return the buyer's deposit. Buying an apartment or townhouse most apartments and townhouses in New South Wales, and all of Australia for that matter, are strata title. Which means you are not only buying real estate, you are also buying into the rights and obligations of being a member of the owner's corporation or body corporate. Being a member of the owner's corporation means you will have a say on issues affecting the building, but it also means you will need to pay strata levies, and the way you can use your property will be restricted by bylaws. You may also need to contribute money for communal issues such as plumbing, roof and window repair and property maintenance, even when you are not directly affected. Because this can affect the value of what you are buying, it is important to get a full picture of the body corporate's activities and that you know exactly what work is planned and whether there is enough money to cover it. While a seller must attach some information about the body corporate to the contract for sale, we at the Queen Group will make sure you have everything you need to reach an informed decision before you buy. Once you are ready to purchase a property, you may be asking how the property purchase actually works. The next chapter will examine this. Chapter 5. The Property Purchase. How it works. The Contract for Sale. When you buy a property in Australia, your rights depend in large part on what is in the contract for sale. Because no two properties are the same, no two contracts will be the same either. However, there are some things a contract for sale must do, including properly identifying the property as well as the terms on which it is being sold. It should also attach a number of documents, the most common of which are a zoning certificate, a drainage diagram showing any sewer lines, a copy of the property certificate, a copy of the plan for the land, and copies of any documents showing easements, right-of-way, restrictions and covenants. 
Sellers of strata properties, generally units or townhouses, should also have attached a copy of the property certificate and strata plan and a copy of the bylaws concerning the use of common property. Buying on your terms. Many of the terms in any contract for sale will be standard ones, which means they have been in use for a long time, but are fair to both the vendor and seller and purchaser and buyer. However, a seller does not have to include these terms and instead may choose to include something in the contract which favours themselves at the buyer's expense. This is why the first thing we will do at the Quinn Group is make sure that the contract for sale is not just legal, but that it is also not unfair to you. Where a clause is not in your interest, we will work to negotiate with the seller's solicitor to get it changed. This includes working out a time to settle the sale, which is when you pay the balance owing and take ownership of the property. Inspections Because you are expected to take the property as you find it, that means you will also sign up to any structural problems, pest infestations and other defects that might not be obvious to the naked eye. That is why it is always best to have someone who knows what they are doing to look over the property first. After all, you may be paying a few hundred dollars up front to save yourself thousands or even tens of thousands of dollars of bother down the track. You should also check whether the contract includes a survey, a building certificate or a homeowner's warranty insurance certificate for any renovations done to the property. If you are buying at auction, it is important that you have any pest or building inspections carried out before the auction. Remember, once the hammer falls down, it is unlikely you will be able to get out of the contract. Sale Inclusions Unless the contract specifically says otherwise, the property will be sold in the state you find it. That also means any fixtures are automatically included. A fixture is anything that cannot easily be taken away without doing damage to the property. For instance, stoves are usually fixtures because they are wired in whereas fridges are not because they can only be in unplugged. Sometimes the seller will attempt to exclude a fixture from the contract for sale. At other times, what constitutes a fixture is not so clear-cut. For instance, removable floor coverings or an above-ground pool. Where anything is in doubt, it should be expressly included in the contract for sale. At the Quinn Group, we will help you make sure you know everything that is included in the sale. Your mortgage documents. To buy a property, most people will need to take out a mortgage. A mortgage gives a lender rights over the land for which they are lending money, including the option of selling it if you default. Exchange. A contract to sell a property becomes binding when the buyer and seller each sign a copy of the contract for sale and exchange them. At exchange, the buyer also usually hands over a deposit, often 10%. At an auction, exchange happens immediately after the winning bid is accepted. For private treaty sales, exchange usually means that you will deliver your signed contract to the seller's agent and pick up the seller's signed copy. Sometimes a seller will be happy to exchange contracts by mail, in which case the seller's signed contract will be delivered to your solicitor. Signing the contract. Sometimes you will be able to get out of the contract for sale and get your deposit back, even when you have signed the contract, and that includes when you have bought a property at auction. For instance, sellers must always comply with the vendor disclosure requirements and warranties. These rules force anyone selling a property to let prospective buyers know certain information about the property they are selling in the contract for sale. This includes making promises about the property and attaching certificates that reveal such things as any rights of way, drainage and zoning. Settlement. When you sign the contract, you will usually agree to a settlement date. Most commonly, this will be six weeks after the date of exchange. At settlement, you will need to pay the seller everything you owe them to settle the purchase of your home. This amount will take into account any utility bill and tax calculations that your solicitor makes. If you cannot settle by the date stipulated in the contract for sale, you're likely to be charged interest. In some circumstances, the seller may even be able to cancel the sale and keep your deposit. You should let your solicitor know as soon as possible if it looks like you cannot make the settlement date, 
so that they can attempt to come to an arrangement with the seller's solicitor. Do you need to be present at settlement? You do not usually need to be attending settlement in person. Instead, your solicitor and the seller's solicitor will meet to make sure they have everything they need for the sale to go ahead. If you are taking out a mortgage to pay for the property, a representative of your bank as well as the seller's bank will also attend settlement. Once that happens, your solicitor will call you to let you know you are the proud owner of a new home. Now that we have gauged what is involved in the property purchase process, we can now investigate investment in property. Chapter 6. Investment in property. Why invest? Investment in property can be a daunting yet rewarding experience. As will be explored in this chapter, there are many advantages and disadvantages of investing in property. Advantages of investing in property Less volatility Property can be less volatile than shares or other investments. Income You receive rental income if the property is tenanted. Capital growth If your property increases in value, you will benefit from a capital gain when you sell. Tax deductions. You can offset most property expenses against rental income, including interest on any loan used to buy the property. Physical asset. You are investing in something you can see and touch. No specialized knowledge required. Unlike some complex investments, you don't need any particular specialized knowledge to invest in property. Disadvantages of investing in property Cost Rental income may cannot cover your mortgage payments and other expenses. Interest rates A rise in interest rates will mean higher repayments and lower disposable income. Vacancy There may be times when you have to cover the cost yourself if you don't have a tenant for your property. Inflexible you cannot sell off a bedroom if you need to access some cash in a hurry. Loss of value. If the property value goes down, you could end up owing more than the property is worth. High entry and exit costs. Expenses such as stamp duty, legal fees and real estate agents fees. Difference between a line of credit and an offset account. A line of credit. A line of credit, otherwise termed as a home equity loan, is a flexible loan from a financial institution that consists of a defined amount of money that you can access as needed and repay either immediately or over time. It can be a standalone product or almost any type of existing loan can be split into an LOC. Interest is usually slightly higher than the standard variable rate and is charged as soon as money is borrowed. Lines of credit are most often used to cover the gaps in irregular monthly income, finance a project whose cost cannot be predicted up front, or to finance a property. In the physical and ebook edition of this audiobook, there is now a table of comparison comparing this type with other types of borrowing. The advantages and disadvantages of a line of credit. Advantages. It is a working account used to manage cash flow, can have lower interest rates than other products like personal loans or credit cards, is a flexible option for a number of purposes, can have a high credit limit making them suitable for larger purposes, interest is only paid on what you use, and can increase the value of your home if used for renovations. The disadvantages of a line of credit are, it eats into your property portfolio's equity, they tend to have higher interest rates and fees than a standard home loan, can be expensive if not used properly, can be risky for those with poor financial discipline. Inability to repay the loan can lose equity or even your property, not offered by every lender. An offset account. An offset account is a standalone transaction account that is specially linked to a loan. As opposed to earning interest on savings, the savings balance is theoretically deducted from the loan balance, which in turn reduces loan interest and keeps the funds separate for tax purposes. The advantages and disadvantages of an offset account. Advantages. Can pay dividends in some instances to borrowers. 
separate funds for tax purposes and other tax benefits, save interest on your home loan. Disadvantages. It's only as affected as the borrower if you spend your personal income rapidly. Buying issues and considerations to be aware of. Whose name should I buy the investment property in? You should always consult a professional regarding what name to purchase your investment property under. Why? There may be double the stamp duty payable if you nominee, that is, use another person's name, in the property transaction. What items are included in the purchase of an investment property? You should always check the contract prior to purchasing an investment property to check for inclusions. Don't forget to ensure. An informed purchaser of an investment property should take out interim insurance to cover any damage incurred on the property prior to pending settlement. Have you heard of rent investing? Rent investing strategy involves purchasing an investment property in an area that suits your budget, generally outside of the city. At the same time, you rent a property in an area that suits your lifestyle. So essentially, you are finding the perfect balance between owning an affordable property and living in your dream home that you can't currently afford to buy. The pros of rent investing. The freedom to live where you want. The main advantage of using the rent investing strategy is the ability to live your dream life while still climbing up the property ladder. Entering the property market sooner. Instead of waiting until you can afford to purchase your dream home, the rent investing strategy allows you to start building your property portfolio sooner. Tax benefits. Owning an investment property allows you to claim several tax deductions that you aren't able to claim if the property was your home. Flexibility. When you're renting, the absence of permanency allows you a degree of flexibility when it comes to choosing a home based on your circumstance. For example, you may get a promotion at a company in another city. Renting gives you the flexibility to move to that city without the hassle of selling a home. Some disadvantage of rent investing you may want to consider. Having to rent your home. As much as you may love the lifestyle that comes with renting your dream home, it's unfortunately not your home. This means you may have difficulty settling into the property as if it was your own and you will have to seek permission and assistance from property managers and landlords if something needs to be fixed or if you simply want to hang a picture on the wall. Counterintuitive. One factor that may dissuade you from going the rent investing route is the idea of purchasing a property just to rent it out while you pay someone else's mortgage at the rental property you live in. Capital gains tax. If you own the house that you live in, you are generally exempt from paying capital gains tax on the eventual sale of your home. However, if you sell an investment property, you are liable to pay capital gains tax on the profit you make from the sale. No access to first homeowner's grant. As you will not be occupying your new home and rather investing it, you won't be able to access the first homeowner's grant. Potential capital loss. It's not always guaranteed that your investment will increase in value. Suppose it decreases in value. If that is the case, you may have to sell it at a loss. Investment in property is an important aspect to understand in property purchases. Now we will look into another one, positive and negative gearing. Chapter seven, positive versus negative gearing. What is positive and negative gearing? There is always debate between whether you should positively or negatively gear your property. But what is positive and negative gearing anyway, and which is best suited to you? Answering these questions is the aim of this chapter. Negatively geared properties are also known as capital growth properties. This is where the costs of owning the property, including principal and interest payments on the mortgage, property maintenance and repairs, real estate agent fees, insurance and council and water rates are more than the rental income being produced. The strategy here is basically to wait for the property to grow in value and later sell it for a profit. In the meantime, you simply have to wear the costs of owning the investment property. Positively geared properties are also known as cash flow properties. This is where the rental income that you receive from your tenants is more than what you pay to own the property. 
This tends to happen in periods of strong rental demand and low interest rates. Let's look at the advantages and disadvantages of negatively geared and positively geared properties. The advantages of positive gearing. You earn money off your property. You increase your lending power. Good for new or old investors. Can help keep your property portfolio in check by covering any losses you incur on negatively geared properties that you own. Disadvantages for positive gearing. Tax. The Australian Taxation Office will take a slice of your rental income. Slow capital growth. Fluctuating growth. Unexpected costs. You'll be taxed on any capital gains made. Advantages. Negative gearing. Claim losses on tax. Capital growth. Disadvantages. Negative gearing. Potentially tied to cash flow, less at borrowing power than positive gearing, and you will be taxed on any capital gains made. We will now in the next chapter investigate rental properties. Chapter 8. Rental Properties and Taxation Rental Expenses You Can Claim You can generally claim an immediate deduction against your current year's income for your expenses related to the management and maintenance of your investment property, including interests and loans. If your property is negatively geared, you may be able to deduct the full amount of rental expenses against your rental and other income, such as salary and wages, and business income. Expenses you can claim. You can claim a deduction for these expenses only if you incur them and they are not paid by the tenant. Expenses you may be entitled to claim an immediate deduction for in the income year you incur them include advertising for tenants, insurance, body corporate fees and charges, interest expenses, council rates, prepaid expenses, water charges, property agents' fees and commission, land tax, income protection insurance, cleaning, repairs and maintenance, gardening and land mowing, some legal expenses and pest control. If you take out a loan to purchase a rental property, you can claim a deduction for the interest charged on the loan or a portion of the interest. However, the property must be rented out or genuinely available for rent in the income year you claim a deduction. You can claim the interest charged on the loan you used to purchase a rental property, purchase a depreciating asset for the rental property, make repairs to the rental property, finance renovations on the rental property which is currently rented out or which you intend to rent out. You can also claim interest you have prepaid up to 12 months in advance. What you can't claim. You can't claim a deduction for interest expenses you incur for any period that you use the property for private purposes, even if it's a short period of time. On a loan you use to buy a new home if you don't use the new home to produce income, even if you use your rental property as security for the loan, and on any portion of the loan you use for private purposes, even if you are ahead in your repayments. Repairs and maintenance. You may be able to claim a full deduction for the cost of repairs and maintenance in the year that you incur them if the expense directly relates to wear and tear or other damage that occurred as a result of renting out property. Rental expenses you can claim over several years. You can generally claim a deduction over several years for expenses you incur that relate to borrowing, your assets decline in value, and capital works. Borrowing expenses. You can claim a deduction for borrowing expenses that directly relate to purchasing your rental property. You incur these expenses in taking out a loan for the purchase of your rental property. If your total borrowing expenses are more than $100, the deduction is spread over five years or the term of the loan, whichever is shorter. If the total borrowing expenses are $100 or less, you can claim a full deduction in the income year that you incur them. Capital expenditure. Capital expenditure you may be able to claim a deduction for over time includes improvements, depreciating assets, initial repairs, capital allowances, and capital works. Improvements. An improvement is anything that makes an aspect of the property better, more valuable, more desirable, or changes the character of the item on which works are carried out. 
Improvements include work that produces a new and different function or adds to the property a function that it did not previously have, that generally furthers the income producing ability or expected life of the property, or that goes beyond just restoring the efficient functioning of the property. Improvements can be either capital works, that is where there is a structural improvement, or capital allowances, where the item is a depreciable asset. Depreciating assets. Depreciable assets are those items that can be described as plant that don't form part of the premises. These items are usually separately identifiable, not likely to be permanent, and are expected to be replaced within a relatively short period, and also those that are not part of the structure of the building. None of these factors alone can determine if an item is part of the premises. They must all be considered together. You may deduct an amount equal to the decline in value for the period you held the depreciating asset during the income year. Substantial renovations. Substantial renovations of a rental property are renovations in which all or substantially all of a building is removed or is replaced. This could include the removal or replacement of foundations, external walls, interior supporting walls, floors, roofs or staircases. For renovations to be substantial, they must directly affect most rooms in a building. The removal and replacement of the exterior walls, the removal of some internal walls and the replacement of the flooring and the kitchen in a house are considered collectively to amount to substantial renovations. Repairs versus improvements. If you conduct a project that includes both repairs and improvements to your property, you can only claim an income tax reduction for the cost of your repairs if you can separate the cost of the repairs from the cost of the improvements. If you hire a builder or other professionals to carry out these works for you, we recommend you ask for an itemised invoice to help work out your claim. We will now examine the various taxes on real property in Australia. Chapter 9. Taxes on property, federal and state. When you buy a property in New South Wales, you may have to pay taxes and duties. We have set out some of the more common taxes here, as well as the process for assessing them. Purchaser Transferee Declaration When you buy a property in New South Wales, you must complete a Purchaser Transferee Declaration. If you're buying with other people, everyone must complete their own declaration. If the purchaser transferee is a corporation, the declaration must be completed by an authorised officer. You must also complete the declaration if a property is transferred to you. Under the Taxation Administration Act 1996, it's an offence to give false or misleading information. Transfer Duty Transfer duty, once known as stamp duty, is payable in every state of Australia when you buy a home, including your first home, an investment property, a holiday home, a business which includes land, and a farming property. A transfer of business assets may also attract transfer duty. You may also pay transfer duty when you receive or are gifted a property without buying it. First Home Buyer's Assistance Scheme If you are a first home buyer, you may be entitled to a concessional rate of transfer duty, or even an exemption from paying it, under the First Home Buyer's Assistance Scheme. Unlike the First Homeowner Grant, the First Home Buyer's Assistance Scheme applies to buying an existing home, buying a new home, and vacant land on which you intend to build a home. Buying off the plan. Buying off the plan is when you enter into a contract or transfer to buy residential property where the home is erected or developed before the contract or transfer is completed. If you buy a home off the plan, which you intend to use as your main residence, you can defer your transfer duty liability for up to 12 months after you sign the agreement or until the property is completed or handed over, whichever comes first. Surcharge Purchaser Duty If you buy land in New South Wales and you're not an Australian or New Zealand citizen, 
You may be classed as a foreign person and have to pay a surcharge purchaser duty. We will discuss the dangers but also benefits of purchasing property when you are a non-resident in a later chapter. Land tax. Land tax is an annual tax levied at the end of the calendar year on property you own that is above the land tax threshold. Your principal place of residence is exempt and other exemptions and concessions may apply. You will have to pay land tax if the unimproved value of all your land holdings is over a certain threshold. The unimproved value is essentially the value of the land without any dwellings or other improvements. Land tax is calculated annually based on your holdings at 31 December and is payable the following year. Capital gains tax. If you sell a capital asset, such as real property, you usually make a capital gain or a capital loss. Unless an exemption applies, you need to report capital gains and losses in your income tax return and pay tax on your capital gains. Although it is referred to as capital gains tax, otherwise termed CGT, this is actually part of your income tax, not a separate tax. When you make a capital gain, it is added to your assessable income and may significantly increase the tax you need to pay. As tax is not usually withheld for capital gains, you may want to work out how much tax you will owe and set aside sufficient funds to cover the relevant amount. This area of taxation requires expertise. It is strongly recommended that you seek professional advice, such as that at Quinn's, to be aware of potential tax liabilities. We will now examine mortgages. Chapter 10. Mortgages. What is a mortgage? A mortgage, otherwise termed home loan, is a loan taken out when you purchase property or land. Notably, there are differences between home loan types. Most people get what is called a principal and interest home loan, as opposed to interest-only loans, as this allows you to pay off the entire amount plus interest accrued on your mortgage. Interest-only mortgages, by comparison, only allow you to pay off the interest, not the principal loan. The Home Loan Application Process The Home Loan Application Process can be quite lengthy, but is not too complicated, thankfully. It will generally involve the following steps. Step 1. Gathering your required documents. Step 2. Comparing home loan providers. Step 3. A preliminary assessment by the lender. Step 4. Submitting your application to the lender. Step 5. The lender completes a property valuation. Step 6. The lender approves or rejects the loan. Step 7. The lender sends you an offer. Step 8. The loan is settled and the funds are advanced to you. How to get a mortgage pre-approval. Documents needed for a home loan pre-approval. Home loan or mortgage pre-approval approves you to borrow up to a certain amount, giving you a good idea of what you can and cannot afford. The documents needed for home loan approval include proof of income, bank statements and proof of savings, a list of your current assets and liabilities, 100 points of ID, driver's license, passport, Medicare, etc. You should note, however, that getting pre-approved does not guarantee your home loan application will be successful. Mortgages unpacked. A mortgage has a number of different components, which we will now outline. Collateral. When you have a mortgage, you have legally committed to repaying the loan plus interest and other costs by the end of the loan term, which is usually 20 to 25 and 30 years. The property you have bought is classed as collateral for the mortgage because real estate generally goes up in value, so it's relatively a safe bet that the lender will be able to recoup its money either when you sell the property, pay it off, or the lender sells it. Principal. In the world of finance, principal is not the headmaster or mistress of a money school, but it is a vitally important part of the equation because it's a sum of money that you borrowed to buy the property in the first place. The principal is the amount that you have agreed to pay back plus interest over the life of the loan or sooner. Interest. 
Interest is the fee that you have to pay to borrow those funds, which is usually a percentage interest rate. It's important to understand that interest rates do change depending on various things such as economic conditions. Plus, with most mortgages being 25 to 30 years in length, you are likely to experience periods of low and high interest rates. Deposit Lenders require some sort of deposit before they will approve a mortgage on a property purchase. While this figure does change depending on financial conditions, it is generally between 5 to 20% of the purchase price. The deposit can be from cash savings, but it can also be drawn from equity in another property. If the deposit is less than 20%, you will generally have to pay Lenders Mortgage Insurance, LMI, which is a policy that protects lenders against borrowers who default on their home loans. This fee does vary depending on how much deposit you have, as well as the state or territory in which your property is located. But it can be useful for first home buyers as it helps them get into the market much sooner than they could if they tried to save a 20% deposit. LMI can also generally be capitalised or added on your mortgage too. Paying off a mortgage. At the end of the day, there are only two ways to pay off a mortgage. One is to pay off the principal and interest components over time, which can be the life of the loan or more quickly if you make extra repayments. The other, of course, is by selling the asset at some point in time. Whichever strategy is right for you, you will eventually have to reduce the debt on your loan to pay the lender back their money. Which type of mortgage is best for you? There are a number of different mortgages available these days with specialised products for different types of buyers. Some of the most common home loans include standard variable rate home loans, basic variable rate home loans, fixed interest loans, split loans, lines of credit, offset loans. Issues to consider. Are you ready for the responsibility? As we said on the outset, mortgages can be a little scary because they're a commitment of 20 to 30 years. However, mortgages are a vehicle to improve your financial position by investing in assets that generally grow in value over time while the principal you borrowed stays the same. Before you apply for a mortgage though, it's a good idea to consider the following questions. One, can you comfortably make the monthly mortgage repayments? Two, are you confident that your financial status will not adversely impact your financial responsibilities over time? Three, can you manage any resultant changes to your lifestyle if required? Four, are you aware of the legal impacts of being unable to continue to finance the facility? We will now examine the Australian Taxation Office, ATO, and their guidance on property development. Chapter 11, ATO Guidance on Property Development. In July 2018, the Australian Taxation Office released the Draft Property and Construction Website Guidance. The draft guideline outlines the ATO's position regarding certain issues relating to the property development industry, such as whether relevant property is held by the taxpayer on capital or revenue accounts, allocation of costs, development agreements, etc. The guideline has two main sections. One. Factors the ATO takes into account deciding whether a sale of land is a mere realisation or a disposal in the course of a business of property development or as a part of profit making undertaking or plan and a number of examples applying the factors in real life cases. In the print and ebook format of this audiobook we will now delve into the ATO's guidance on property development. For those of you listening let's go on to chapter 12. Chapter 12 Property Sales Before You Sell The Contract for Sale The first thing you need to do if you are selling your house or apartment is to prepare a contract for sale. Putting your house on the market without having a proper contract is an offence and could lead to you being fined. Further, legislation says that all sellers must include certain information in the contract for sale and must also make certain promises known legally as warranties, about the property they are selling. These obligations are also known as the vendor disclosure requirements. The most common documents you may need to include with the contract are 
a zoning certificate, a drainage diagram, an identification survey, a building certificate, and a homeowner's warranty insurance certificate. Selling strata title property. Most apartments in New South Wales, for example, are strata title. If you are selling a strata title property, you will also need to include a copy of the property certificate for the lot and common property, a copy of the strata plan showing the lot, a copy of any changes of bylaws affecting the use of common property. Contractual compliance. What warranties are you deemed to have made about the property? Unless the contract for sale includes specific information that says otherwise, by putting your property on the market, you are deemed to have made several promises about it. These include that the land isn't subject to any adverse affectation, that there's no sewer on the land that isn't shown in the drainage diagram, that the zoning certificate gives an accurate picture of the zoning of the land at the date of the contract. What happens if the contract does not comply? If you do not comply with these vendor disclosure requirements and there turns out to be a problem with the property, the buyer may be able to cancel the contract for sale, in which case you'll also have to return their deposit. This could be very serious if you've already bought a new home. Standard or tailored terms. Many of the terms in any contract for sale will be standard. As we have discussed in a previous chapter, this means that they have been in use for a long time and are generally considered to be fair to both the buyer and the seller. You do not necessarily have to include all these terms in your contract, especially they do not reflect your needs for the property you are selling. Your solicitor should make sure that the contract for sale meets the legal requirements, but is also in your best interest. That said, it is likely that any buyer will want to negotiate some of the terms on which they are buying. For instance, if they are also selling a home, they might want a longer or shorter settlement period than normal. Alternatively, they may want to make sure certain items, such as the blinds, are included as fixtures. Your solicitor will continue to negotiate with the buyer's solicitor to make sure that you still sell on your terms. Cooling off periods. As we've discussed in an earlier chapter, a cooling off period gives a buyer the chance to consider whether they really want to enter the contract once the emotion of making an offer has subsided. Potential buyers will usually forfeit 0.25% of the purchase price if they pull out during the cooling off period. In some circumstances, you can ask the buyer to waive the cooling off period, especially if they have a solicitor acting for them and have done their searches and inspections. Agent fees. One cost you should factor into the sale is the agent's commission. It is usually a good idea to shop around and compare commission rates of various agents as well as the services being provided. You should also have your legal team, such as our team at the Quinn Group, review the agent's agreement before you sign it. We now move on to our final chapter on non-residents and property. Chapter 13 Non-Residents and Property Purchasing Property as a Non-Resident in Australia Non-Residents, that is foreigners to Australia, can purchase property in Australia, however there are restrictions imposed to consider. You must get approval from the Foreign Investment Review Board before you can buy. Notably, non-residents cannot generally purchase established dwellings or properties, but can, however, subject to conditions, purchase vacant land for residential building. Non-residents can also purchase new properties with no conditions. Temporary residents are also subject to certain conditions as imposed by the Foreign Investment Review Board. Temporary residents cannot buy established properties as investments, can only purchase one established property which must also be their primary place of residence, and are allowed to buy an established home for redevelopment subject to some conditions. For new dwellings or homes, if the Foreign Investment Review Board approves each purchase, temporary residents can purchase as many new homes as they desire. This is of course provided that the place has never been sold as a property before or has been built to replace one. Taxes on property for non-residents. There are different tax treatments for property depending on your residency status. 
To understand your tax situation, you first need to work out if you are an Australian or foreign resident for tax purposes. The Australian Taxation Office, ATO, uses different standards to the Department of Immigration and Border Protection to determine your residency for tax purposes. Capital Gains Tax, CGT The General 50% CGT Discount Up to 8th May 2012, the CGT discount of 50% was available to foreign residents individuals who were subject to CGT on taxable Australian property. For assets acquired after this date, the discount is generally not available to foreign and temporary resident individuals. The discount is apportioned where a CGT event happens after 8th of May 2012 and you acquired the asset before that date or you had a period of Australian residency after that date. Main Residence CGT Exemption From 9 May 2017, the Government removed the entitlement to the CGT Main Residence Exemption for foreign residents that have dwellings that qualify as their main residence. Therefore, any such capital gain or loss arising upon disposal of a foreign resident's main residence will need to be recognised. New South Wales Land Tax and Stamp Duty Surcharge Stamp Duty The 2016 New South Wales Budget introduced a surcharge purchaser duty, stamp duty, on the purchase of residential real estate by foreign persons. The surcharge is in addition to the stamp duty payable on the purchase of residential property. As a result of the 2017 budget, the stamp duty surcharge has been increased from 4% to 8% for agreements that were entered into on or after 1 July 2017. Further, a foreign person is no longer entitled to the 12-month deferral for the payment of stamp duty for off-the-plan purchases of residential property. Land Tax A foreign person who owns residential land in New South Wales must pay a surcharge. This is 0.75% for the 2017 land tax year and 2% from the 2018 land tax year onwards. The surcharge is in addition to any land tax a foreign person may already pay. The surcharge may be payable even if a person does not pay land tax, however. Annual Charge on Foreign Owners of Underutilised Residential Property The foreign owners of residential property, where the property is not occupied or generally available on the rental market for at least 183 days each vacancy year, will be subject to an annual levy starting at 5500 if your tax residency status is unclear, it is prudent that you seek legal advice to ensure you remain tax compliant in Australia and minimise your exposure to any potential penalties and interest. This applies regardless of whether you are an Australian citizen working overseas or a foreign citizen working in Australia. Your circumstances may also enable you to access concessions under various double taxation treaties. We now move on to our conclusion. Conclusion We have through this book provided a detailed overview of the processes of property law, purchases and sales of property, the tax implications and the costs involved. However, if you feel this audiobook should include any further information, please do not hesitate to contact us via email at info at we value the feedback of our readers and clients and appreciate any comments to make this resource more helpful. Thank you for listening. Bye for now.